Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think I chose this topic because screening is getting uh, very good. And at least in the UK, we are finding out that probably right aortic arch is one of the most common abnormalities that uh, we, we didn't know existed so, so frequently. So I think I have to say I have no conflict of interest and I'm also, I've said everything I'm saying in this lecture is my own views, um, just for the purpose of the presentation. Now, what I'm going to try and cover here relatively quickly, but hopefully the message will be clear at the end of the day, is so that you understand what aortic arch laterality is, to be able to recognize and to manage uh, right aortic arch, uh, a similar thing for double aortic arch, and a tiny little bit about the thymus, because that's important for uh, trying to predict risks of chromosomal abnormalities in vascular rings. So if I start with uh, what is aortic arch laterality, you know, laterality is very important. The feet start from the side to determine right and left, and we're all hearing right and left aortic arch. So just a little bit of background, because these are not completely new insights, but maybe with fetal scanning we are understanding more about vascular rings. So description of uh, anomalous right subclavian arteries, which you all know about, uh, double aortic arch, right aortic arch, date for you know, the 1700s, it's a long time ago. Uh, barium swallow, which was the classical clinical tool to diagnose vascular ring, and just based on that, postnatally children will go for surgery. And surgery, the first vascular ring surgery was in 1945. So all of this is very old stuff. But now I think with fetal scanning, we are able to understand uh, and much more about the, uh, what constitutes and what not constitutes a vascular ring. So for the pediatricians, um, presentation of uh, right aortic arch is not very common. Um, but in the general population, as I said, it seems to be more common than we anticipated. There has been a great increase in prenatal diagnosis because of the screening incorporating in particular the three-vessel and three-vessel trachea view. And then the pediatricians are faced with fetal diagnosis of aberrant right subclavian artery, right aortic arch with aberrant left subclavian artery, double aortic arch, and people with scanning prenatal need to tell them what to expect and how to manage the babies postnatally, not only uh, in the fetal medicine um, scenario. So they, they have this question, they have to try and understand. And I think for the uh, fetal medicine person, obstetrician scanning, it is important to um, understand what is meant by right and left aortic arch. So by definition, a left arch is an arch that crosses... Is an arch that crosses... Is it still working? Yes. That crosses... Uh, the bronchus, so a left arch crosses the left bronchus and is also to the left side of the trachea. So that's a key point in the prenatal diagnosis. And the right arch crosses the right bronchus and is to the right of the trachea. And it's the trachea that we're going to use to determine prenatally if it's a right or left aortic arch. So in, in this diagram, I'm just going to put here the, the branches of the aorta, and it's very difficult to really draw it here because the three-dimensional structure, and we come back to that. And a right arch is, the easiest way to understand that, it's like flipping the aorta over. So a lot of people think that the aorta just moves over to the right of the trachea, but it's not. It's, that's why it's called a mirror image, because you have your aorta. I can't talk without my hands, I'm afraid. You have your aorta doing this. It's, it's not just transferring to the other side. It is actually flipping over. And that's fundamental to understand the difference between a right and a left aortic arch. So more considerations. Um, it's really a three-dimensional structure, but we're looking at it uh, on a two-dimensional assessment, although a lot of you will be doing scanning. But on a day-to-day -day basis, on a screening techniques, it is two-dimensional. In the child, the side of the aortic arch can be easily seen, usually on a chest radiograph, in relation to the trachea. Uh, also, we use echocardiography, CT scan, and geography. And the main way of looking at these techniques is to look at the branching pattern of the aorta. And that's, again, key for the diagnosis of right and left aortic arch. So let's try and understand first what a left arch is, 
we've already defined that it is to the left of the trachea. And it can have the usual pattern of uh, bifurcation of the head and neck vessels, which is the normal. And it can also have an anomalous right subclavian artery, which we're finding out is very common with a left-sided arterial duct. There's something I put much smaller there, which is the only cases when an anomalous right subclavian artery will cause a problem is if you have a, a, a left aortic artery with a right duct. And I don't think I've ever seen a case like that. It's very, very rare. So this is a diagram of a, a left aortic artery. And I usually draw this to the patient so they understand themselves what it means to be a left or a right aortic artery. So the first branch of a left arch is the one that goes to the right side, and it divides into the right common carotid uh, and the right subclavian artery. The, first, the second branch goes to the left side of the head, and the last branch goes to the left arm. So this is the usual pattern. And this is a diagram here, which I borrowed from uh, a website. Uh, showing very clearly this coming in front of the trachea and gives more of a three-dimensional view. So this is the normal branching pattern of a left arch. In the neonate, as I said, we try and see how it's branching. We can't see the trachea so clearly in the neonate. So this is a, a very high suprasternal view in a child, uh, and we follow the aorta coming up here, and we see the orientation being right and left, so it's a parasagittal view, and we see the first branch of the aorta going to the right, and therefore is a left aortic arch. So we don't necessarily need to see that in the fetus, but there we come to a fetal image, the whole aortic arch. Is it right or is it left side? And I think one has to understand that you cannot say, just based on that image, if the aorta is right or left-sided, because our orientation is anterior, posterior, inferior, and superior. So you need to have different planes to assess the laterality of the aortic arch. So having gone through that, in the fetus, we don't need to use that branching pattern, although we can see that. Uh, the easiest way, particularly from the screening point of view, is to see the position of the aorta in relation to the fluid-filled trachea. And if you don't see the trachea, just do like you do for the stomach. You wait a little bit because the baby will, s will inhale more fluid and the trachea will become more visible. So that's quite a, an old image, but it shows very clearly here the three-vessel trachea view, the trachea fluid-filled, and you have to first get the laterality to the fetus, so this is the left side, this is the aortic arch to the left of the trachea. And of course, if you use color, that will facilitate anomalies, enormously seeing the two arches. And you're familiar with that appearance of a normal left duct and a left aortic arch forming that classical V-shape. Um, and this is a clip to show you exactly the same. So always important to have your orientation. So ductal arch, aortic arch, you see the trachea, baby's breathing a little bit, and you see the azygous vein coming here into the superior vena cava. So very straightforward. So <coughs> let's look now in the fetus, the, the branching pattern of the left aortic arch. And we are here on a short clip showing the V-shape of the right and the, uh, the sorry, the, the left duct and the left uh, aortic arch, position of the trachea. This is the right side. This is a very high uh, paristern, very high uh, mediastinal view and we're looking for a vessel from the diagram coming in front of the trachea, which will go to the right arm. And as you go a little bit higher from the three-vessel trachea view, it's very clear here, and it's going towards the right arm. So it's a normal origin of the right subclavian artery, which is in front of the trachea. So what about an anomalous right subclavian artery? So we have our first branch, which only goes to the head, and we have the other two and the third, and the fourth branch comes from the descending aorta, and that will go behind the trachea and the zoophyx to reach the right arm. So this is a fetal image, again, a high, high uh, axial view, 
through the mediastinum. You have the two arches here, the trachea, almost a bifurcation, and you see here vessel coming posterior, which is the aberrant right subclavian artery, and you can see here it will go towards the right arm. So it's a very characteristic image of an aberrant right subclavian artery. Now, this is probably the most common arch anomaly, and if you're looking for that, in particular the new equipment now, sometimes you don't need to look, you see that very clearly on the scan. The important thing to remember is it is common in the general population, relatively common, it's supposed to be 0.5% in adult series, 0.5% in fetuses, low-risk pregnancies, it's 1.5% in children that have congenital heart disease, there is an association with that with heart abnormalities, but it's meant to be 10 to 30% of fetuses that have trisomy 21. Usually they have other abnormalities as well. From the cardiac point of view, it is important to know that if you say that the family, they get very worried, but this does not form a vascular ring. So left arch, left duct, the band, right subclavian arch, it's not a vascular ring. The neonate is asymptomatic, and we don't expect any symptoms. They can reassure the family, but sometimes it's important for them to check that the brachial pulses are normal because they think it's coming from the wrong place and there may be a problem, and that's not usually the case. The only case when it may be a problem is, is if you have a right duct as well, uh, instead of a left duct in a, in a left arch. So we've gone through the normal laterality. Let's move on to the right aortic arch. Uh, same definition, passing to the right of the trachea. So a right arch, you can have a mirror image branching, and it can have, it's going to be now an anomalous left subclavian arch because it's all a mirror image of the normal left aortic arch. So a right side aortic arch can occur with a left side arterial duct as well as with a right-sided arterial duct, and they have different implications. Uh, it can also have a, a left-sided descending aorta. Most of these will come with a right-sided descending aorta. So if we go back to our diagram, you can see I've just flipped the image. So in a right aortic arch, your first branch goes to the left side, left arm, left common carotid. Your second branch goes to the right side, the right common carotid and the last branch is the right subclavian artery. So if you have a right-sided arch with a mirror image of the vessels, it does not form a vascular ring, but it's commonly associated with intracardiac abnormalities, the challenge of fallow, can occur with transposition of the great artery as well, VSD, truncus arteriosus. If you have a right arch with a left-sided duct, which is something we're seeing very often now, but if it has a normal branching pattern, again, it does not form a vascular ring and is normally seen with a normal intracardiac anatomy. So if you can see here a similar diagram, when, when the aorta flips over to the other side, it takes a, 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 a quite a funny orientation. You see here the first branch of the normal branching of the mirror image pattern. It goes in front of the trachea as well and it's the brachiocephalic to the left. So how do we see that in a fetal scan? Well, it's not very common to have a normal branching pattern on the right arch and left duct. Most of them have an anomalous subclavian artery, so it took me some time to grab a picture of that. So we see here the two arches, a left duct, a right uh, aortic artery, a trachea in the middle, and if we're looking for a aberrant left subclavian artery, so a vessel coming off the aorta here that will go towards the left shoulder. And there it comes here, following in front of the trachea, going to the left arm. So that's a normal origin of the left subclavian artery with a right aortic arch. Now, we can have as well a right aortic arch and a right-sided arterial duct, so quite a lot of combinations. Uh, and this is also being picked up more because of the improved in screening. And as we move up towards the major upper mediastinum, you see here both the aortic arch and the ductal arch to the right of the trachea. And if you follow through, you get the branch of the aorta coming here towards the left and is going towards the left arm. So this is a right 
arch with a right duct and a normal origin of the left subclavian artery. So getting your orientation is very important because when you're scanning upwards, you need to see, am I on the right or the left side? Which arm am I looking for? So as I said, right arch with an aberrant left subclavian is quite common if you have a right arch and a left duct. Most cases, more than 80%, 90% will have an, uh, an aberrant left subclavian arch. We're learning that because we're seeing many cases of a right arch. So increasingly diagnosed prenatal. And this is probably the one that you see more often, yeah? which is like a U-shape, different from that V-shape. And you have here a right-sided aortic arch, the trachea is quite clearly seen, a left-sided duct, and they will join here at some point. And you see here flashing behind the trachea, coursing is the uh, aberrant left subclavian artery. Very clearly shown, usually you need the color to demonstrate that. So postnatal management in the neonate, right arch, left duct, with a normal origin. Uh, it does not form a vascular ring. You just need to think more about uh, extra cardiac abnormalities and chromosome abnormalities. Check the pulses just to reassure the family that uh, there is no issues, particularly if you have an aberrant subclavian artery. Uh, not an urgent cardiac review because the child is expected to be asymptomatic if you have a, a, a normal subclavian artery. CT scan is becoming more into fashion. If you have an aberrant subclavian artery, a lot of these children will be asymptomatic. Should we do a CT scan on that or not? Now, a right arch with an aberrant left subclavian artery will form a vascular ring, but with a normal left subclavian artery, it will not form a vascular ring. So it's very important to determine the origin of that vessel. If you have an aberrant subclavian artery, the symptoms, which are usually stridor, dysphagia, they will present later, not usually in the first months of life, usually in the first few months, but it can go up to 24 months or two years. So follow-up of this student is important after birth. This is a meta-analysis we did looking at the symptoms requiring surgery for right aortic artery with an aberrant left subclavian artery. And you can see most of the symptoms are early in life, and the vast majority of children are asymptomatic and not requiring surgery quite a few years down the line. So it's a good prognosis. Overall risk of right aortic arch for chromosomal abnormality is about 9% from that meta-analysis. For 22Q deletion, 6%. Uh, if there are no extra cardiac abnormalities, that risk reduces 5% approximately for chromosomal abnormalities and about 5% of 22Q11. Also important is the, the prevalence of extra cardiac abnormalities, which is probably more prevalent than, cardi than chromosome abnormalities. Uh, a large number is seen prenatally, and then postnatally there is still a chance of about 5%. You're going to find something postnatally that was not identified prenatally. Now we move on to dobiotic arch. And there is our diagram again. There are a few things to understand double arch. This is not a child, so the arterial duct is not represented here. We have a, a right arch and a left arch. So it's meant to be more rare than the right aortic arch, but actually a lot of the right arches we are seeing, if we look very closely, sometimes they have a second smaller left arch. If we don't look for that, we may actually miss the diagnosis of a double aortic arch. So again, increased prenatal diagnosis because of increased screening. There are two arches, and therefore this is a vascular ring, and they are usually symptomatic. Remember that the right arch, they're not quite together. The right arch is higher up in the chest, so you may or may not see the two together. You may have to angulate your probe. The right is usually a dominant arch. It's bigger than the left, and it's more superior. So... Each arch will give two branches. The right gives the uh, right common carotid and right subclavian. The left will give the left common carotid and the left subclavian. And they will join up behind and they encircle the trachea. So this is a classical uh, vascular ring and usually symptomatic and may present in the neonate contrary to the right aortic arch. So this is a still image showing here 
the, the two arches encircling the trachea, that's the right side, there's a superior vena cava, and you can see in this other still the ductal arch coming here. So in fact, we have three arches in the fetus, the double arch and the left side is usually uh, arterial duct. This is a 2D image, uh, which I quite like to use, and I encourage you to do that. This is on the, uh, on the system here, but you can do that uh, you know, almost every machine by reducing your gain completely, and it looks like, to me, it looks like a, uh, a three-dimensional image. So this is orientation's right side, so that's your right aortic arch. Here you have a left aortic arch, and the arterial duct coming here, so there's a double aortic arch. And the, in this case, the two arches are approximately the same size. This is the same fetus, a little bit late in gestation, about 34 weeks. You can see that the arterial duct is more tortuous. And you have here separately, quite clearly seen, the left arch and the right arch and the trachea. So not always that easy, because the left arch can be smaller. This is a different patient, and you see on that image alone, you might think this is just a right arch with a left duct. But as you go a little bit below that, you can see that there's a second arch which is smaller. And in some cases, that can be so much smaller that it might be difficult to image. So you need to be aware that whenever you see a right arch and a left duct, spend some time trying to identify if there is a second smaller left arch, because that will mean that child is most likely going to be symptomatic. So we're coming towards the end. Uh, to assess the thymus, and I only want to put here a few slides because 22Q11 in particular, not so much the double aortic arch, there's an increase in risk of 22Q11 deletion. And if you look at the thymus, uh, it's an important marker for uh, chromosome abnormality. And this is a paper from Rabbi Chowee. If you haven't seen it, it's worth looking at that. He calculated the ratio of the thymus in here from the sternum until the anterior part of the aorta in relation to the whole uh, chest, the whole, and, and you have a ratio, and there's a nice graph, and as a rule of thumb, that ratio is about 0.45, so from 0.35 to 0.55. So this is published in the EOG. So these are normal fetuses, and these are fetuses that had uh, 22Q11 with a hypoplasia of the thymus or an absent thymus. This is another paper that uh, teaches you how to look at the thymus by delineating the subclavian arteries. Uh, in between is the thymus, it's called the thigh box, and there's a paper by Palladini, and there's a picture from his publication. So it's very important to go up in the chest and identify the subclavian artery. You don't necessarily need to see the subclavian artery because um, the internal mammaries are branches of the subclavian. So here's the right internal memory, here's the left internal memory coming off the subclavian, and that, you know, the thymus is in between here, so it's a normal thymus. This is not from a right aortic arch, it's in fact a patient with an interrupted aortic arch, and you can see how small that ratio is here between the anterior chest wall and the aorta, which you can hardly see here because it's very small, but it's a very small space delineated here by the two subclavian arteries. So I think you're probably feeling this is very complicated. There are so many options. What is a vascular ring? What isn't? So all the options are there. We moved on to the other one, which facilitates. So on a left arch, you can have a duct on the right, a duct on the left. You can have normal subclavian, abnormal subclavian. The same for the right arch. You can have a duct on one side, duct on the other side. How are you going to remember what forms a vascular ring? So if you just take away most of the things, and you're left with what forms a vascular ring. So if we start from the bottom here, double arch is a vascular ring. A right arch with a left duct and an aberrant left subclavian artery is a vascular ring. They may not have symptoms that it forms a ring. And a left arch with a right duct, this is very, very rare with a normal heart. I've never seen that. Usually with a intracard, particularly the tetralogy of Fowler. So left arch with a right duct and an aberrant right subclavian artery, that will form a vascular ring. This is very rare. So really, it's coming down to these two, the most two common is a double aortic arch and a right arch with a left duct and an aberrant left subclavian. So that makes it simple, yeah? 
So we've gone through all the options, but you still need to determine the origin of the arteries before you can come to this diagnosis. Once you come to this, and then you know that child potentially could be symptomatic. I think you're all having your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for your attention. I think I've been a bit over time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Caballo, for this very systematic and clearly didactic, uh, interesting presentation. Uh, are there specific questions now which we should... Are somebody here to raise a question? Microphone? No? So clear? Okay. <laughs> no, this was so systematically clear. Switch to the microphone of the head microphone. I don't think we're going to show you a right arch or a double arch. This is a normal fetus. And um, so we're just going to show you a little bit about the normal right left arch and, and the left duct very briefly, because we only have a few minutes. Um, and the fetus has changed position, I think. So this fetus is um, head up, so it's in a bridge position. It has moved a little bit. Which preset are we in? Yeah. And just find the position of this fetus. It's always worth uh, spending a bit of time with the screen very wide to try and find where the fetus is, find the best position, and this baby is going to move. Narrowing the sector, maybe make it a little bit bigger. I just change the frequency to high frequency so we can see a better definition here. So you all know about the four chamber view. So we come here to the three vessel trachea view. Um, right side is over here, superior vena cava, aortic arch, and pulmonary arch with the ductal arch. So I'm going to put the color and um, split the image. So we have our four chamber. We tilt towards the baby's head. We get our um, left ventricular outflow track coming towards the right shoulder. Tilt a bit more. We're coming up to the three vessel, three vessel trachea view. That's the trachea, superior vena cava, aortic arch to the left of the trachea, ductal arch. And in this case, you can see the thymus very clearly. Can you see here the origin of the right subclavian artery? Yeah, coming here in front of the trachea. Our orientation here is right. You see a bit of the left subclavian over there as well. So I wasn't even looking for the subclavian, but the color is very sensitive. Let's do it again. So if you are on your four chamber, left ventricular outflow track, screening views, bifurcation of the pulmonary artery, three-vessel view, three-vessel trachea view, a little bit higher up from there, there is your right subclavian. This is the nominate vein, right SVC, right subclavian artery, normal, normal origin, trachea, and then that's the left subclavian artery. Now I'm going to lower the velocity a little bit to see if we can capture the subclavian arteries. Sorry, the, the mammar internal mammaries, can you see them nicely there? Actually, the image is, is quite clear that even without the internal memory, you can see here demarcation of the thymus, but sometimes not so easy. So you can see one subclavian coming here, one here, that that's the thigh box, so-called thigh box. So it's very easy with the high definition Beautiful. So we can use that with the conventional color as well, but you need to lower your velocity to pick up the, the subclavian and to pick up the internal memory. Again, the same. So 
So it's not too difficult to do. And the feet is cooperative, because I tried earlier on, it was fine up. So that's just a repetition here. So if you go to a sagittal view, you wouldn't be able to say the position of the aortic artery if it's right or left side. That's our aortic arch. Baby's moving. So the, the baby moves a lot, and then you get a lot of artifact with the high definition. So it's a nice aortic arch. I was just going to try and do something here for you to see, because I think it's a nice image, if I can get there. So you see how easy it is, just cut down all your gain. Particularly the patient is high BMI. Sometimes this is a tool that I would encourage you to use. You don't have to pay extra on your machine, you just turn the gain down, so they can't charge you for that. So it's very easy to... See the aortic arch and the branches. Yeah? So yeah, it's quite nice. So back onto the onto the gains. Okay, I think I'll have about five minutes. Anything that you want me to show or no very quiet? Everything seen? Clear? I try to concentrate on the arch and duct, and but is there anything else you want me to show, or shall we move on? Yeah. To show, sorry. The nominate vein. vein. Okay. So the nominate vein is. Sorry, let's make this bigger. It's high in the mediastinum. It's usually above the uh, aortic arch. So if you come up in the mediastinum, maybe I split the image. So you can see the SVC here, yeah? So the nominal vein is joining up the jugglers coming into the SVC. So the direction of flow is going to be from left to right, yeah? Can you see here? It's a vein. The, the two things here, this is the aortic arch with the branching, the subclavian, another subclavian, and in front here is a venous signal. Yeah? The very close, it usually is above the aortic arch. Sometimes it can be quite curved here, almost as if it's within the thymus. Can you see that? So I'm just angulating a little bit. There. This is the innominate vein. Yeah, you can see it here as well. And we will join the SVC, yeah? Anything else? Anything else? Okay. Great. Thank you very so much. Thank you very much.